vamos a pasar al último caso práctico antes de escuchar la mesa redonda sobre información y desinformación. Eh, es la mesa de Jan Walker, de la New Democracy. La New Democracy Foundation, eh, basada en Sydney, en Australia, fue creada por Luca Belgiorno Netis, un hombre que no debe dormir mucho porque, aparte de tener una formación de arquitecto y estar involucrado en unas cuantas organizaciones culturales, dirige varias empresas y fue también, en algún momento de su vida, donante de un partido político. Hasta que conoció esto del sorteo y la deliberación y decidió, en vez de eh, eh, dar dinero a, partidos, a un partido político en concreto, eh, fundar eh, y financiar una fundación, que es eh, la fundación que dirige Jan. Me gustaría también decir tres cosas de esta, de esta fundación, porque realmente tiene un perfil muy, muy peculiar, creo. Eh, junta tres facetas muy importantes y creo que su testimonio va a ser o sea, realmente muy, muy útil y muy importante. Tienen mucha experiencia, han conducido más de 24 eh, jurados y asambleas ciudadanas en, en todo el país, en toda Australia. Eh, también tienen una faceta de investigación que si os metéis en la web encontraréis un montón de... de de, 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 de artículos, o sea, no quiero decir eh, eh, artículos largos, pesados de los, de los investigadores que nadie puede leer, o sea, yo no puedo leer, sino realmente notas muy precisas, muy concretas, que entran al grano, que, que cuentan cómo lo hacen y que cuentan muchas veces en lo que han fallado y lo que quieren mejorar para la próxima. Y muchos de esos papers son, son escritos por Lynn Carson, que es la que he citado antes con el cuadro este sobre la deliberación. Y también tienen una tercera faceta, que es la de difundir en el mundo, que es la faceta que igual hace más eh, Jan Walker. Eh, está ayudando en, la, en, la, en el diseño y la creación del Observatorio de Madrid y también ahora están en un proyecto con Naciones Unidas que, es, que nos contará. Gracias, Jan. Good afternoon. I stand here feeling I deliver the third best projects in the world. Because you've heard from David Farrell in Ireland. It is the best example. You've just heard about the Oregon experiment. Yeah, we look at that with envy. Why we took on this decision to work with the team at Media Lab in the city is there is a chance for the Observatorio to be a little bit better than them and I am competitive. Now in the time that we have together, I want to just share a simple idea. I want you to think about the problem we're trying to solve with all of this. Now to people, I hope this translates okay, but back in the days in the, in the Middle Ages, when the Black Death, the plague, spread across Europe, do you know what people thought the problem was? They thought that cats were spreading it. So they killed all the cats. Now, given that rats were actually spreading it, killing the cats made it worse, much worse. And a third of the population died. And my point in starting with this is to think, if you don't decide what's the problem, and if you don't get that right, your solution can make things worse. And I want to caution you that if you come in thinking, I just need more citizens all the time, maybe you make it worse. Now, I have a view on what the problem and what the challenges are with democracies around the world. And it's that we have built a system that is excessively responsive to public opinion. Politicians seeking election are very adept at trying to get your 10 second response, trying to get that emotional response. So if you agree with me that public opinion is a problem, how do we avoid building giant public opinion machines? And that's really the point of deliberative democracy. Let's see if I go the right way. Really briefly, who we are. We're a charity trying to restore trust to democracy. We have a point of view that there is a role for randomly selected everyday people in making that decision. These are people who can counterbalance and sit on the other side of a seesaw where we have elected representatives 
and randomly selected citizens standing alongside. And that's what Ireland, that's what Oregon have done so well. As Arantxa mentioned, uh, we are funded by a former political donor, uh, actually one of the wealthier people in Australia. His father started a very large infrastructure company. We still own assets like the Harbour Tunnel uh, in Sydney. And what this means is that every politician came to knock on the door, <laughs> where is my donation? And in 2007, he walked out and said, I'll write you any donation you want if you will change how we do democracy. And the politician concerned, who we don't name because it would look partisan, said, you'll write your cheque anyway if you want to work in this state and nothing will change. He called the University of Sydney, said, who do I donate to that takes money out of politics? They said, you're an idiot. You can't take money out of politics. Money will always win elections. So what, if it, what is it? What if it is the case that elections are the problem? They encouraged him to read a few books about deliberative democracy. And he took away this idea and said, these ideas are fantastic, but where are they being done? And the university said, well, we produce journal papers, uh, we attend conferences, we teach students. But doing them, that, that would take three or four million dollars. <coughs> All right, let's do that. So that is who we are as new democracy. We act as a bridge between really great ideas in academia and mayors, ministers, premiers, governments, and, and you've heard from the people championing this in elected office, who want to see democracy done better. It's great that there is that political will. We try to be the operational side who can design and deliver this. Now, a lot of you will think, this is impossible. How can you turn up to politicians and say democracy needs to change? The system must be perfect. It elected them. Now, what we find is that people in politics absolutely realise that their job is hard. Why? Because of public opinion. Most problems that need to be solved have some bad news attached. But the job of seeking election is to give everyone the good news. Everything will be good if you vote for me. And that is the challenge we're really seeking to drive at. It was asked yesterday what people's aspirations were for how the world could be better. I have, I have a real answer for that. And I look at the one, the promise I hold out for direct democracy. And I don't like a lot of the tools today. But the promise is this. Don't give people a wish list vote. Don't ask people if they want a, a wonderful new train service. Of course they want that. Present them with the trade-off. And this is where we see the capacity of citizens, as you've seen in the earlier presentations, to explore what the trade-offs and honestly present them. That is the chance for what deliberation can do. It's the airing of the hard problems when it can be very hard for those in elected office to share that problem. And then in the direct democracy environment where you are going to send people that referendum question, exactly as you saw in Oregon, actually don't just ask people to put a number or a tick in a box. Give them just a page or two of information. Ideally, some information they can trust because it was written by people like them. That's why politicians will talk to us and hopefully talk to you as well. You've heard from a number of people regarding the models that they use. And the thing I always hope people will take away is we actually all do things slightly differently. We insist uh, that there was a question earlier about how people write the reports. We mandate in our designs that citizens write every word that goes in. We do not let government or facilitators edit the document. Not everyone does that. Cultures are different. Uh, I saw from Robin's presentation, they ask citizens uh, their voting uh, alignment. We would not dare do that in Australia. What I want you to take away is that design differences are fine. You're going to match it to your local culture. But principles matter. And the principles are simple. Please just take away those five lines and, and I'll be happy and, and sleep well on my flight home. Really simply, why do we believe in random selection? It's because of representativeness. Most times governments go out to ask a question. Do you know who you hear from? It's a bell curve of views. 
and you hear from the people at this end saying, government, you absolutely have to do this or the world will end. And you hear from these people saying, whatever you do, don't do what they want. And government gets returned two sets of views. It's not useful. What is useful in making a trusted decision is the chance to find common ground. We need to get beyond the enraged and the articulate. Frankly, the most educated, those with most time on their hands. In Australia, 55 to 64 year old retired white collar men. That's who has a say yelling at government. We, we need to find a method to sample the population and say, I've got people 50-50 male and female, every age group, blue collar, white collar, no job, a mix of people in the room. That's a representative group. The next critical principle, again touched on by every speaker, and I, I hope the, um, uh, the, the island example is a, wonderful, is a wonderful example. Don't just rush to ask people what their answer is. Try to encourage them, provide the space and the time through your design that they consider a range of sources, that they consider a viewpoint that isn't their own. Critically, you actually ask them, in order to make an informed decision, what do you need to know? And who do you trust to provide that information? We live in an era of mistrust of expertise. So let them control the sources. And the more sources people consume, that's an interesting way to incorporate expertise into the decision. Now, if you're going to take a really mixed group of people and you're going to ask them to consume a lot of information, the magic ingredient is always time. Time is it. The more time you give to these processes, the better they run. I think in Ireland we saw some of their examples being eight to nine months that citizens were brought together. Give them time and space between meetings. Let the, our standard gap is to let people go away for three weeks. Clear remit and authority. Ask people a question that is resonant to their lives. We did a project for the City of Melbourne. Uh, the City of Melbourne uh, has about a $400 million annual budget. After an election, they had overspent on their commitments by $1.22 billion uh, on a 10-year basis. The question that the council wanted to ask citizens was how can we continue to excel in financial sustainability while, retaining, while remaining the world's most livable city? And I said, Mr. Mayor, um, Kim Jong-il would not ask that of his citizens. That is propaganda. We're going to ask citizens, how can we live within our means? Now, if you're a citizen getting something in the mailbox, an invitation to participate, we present the problem. We don't sell you an answer. We simply say, here is a problem. Are you willing to contribute to solving it? Yes, we always pay people. It's absolutely an equality measure. Otherwise, people in younger, lower income groups will not turn up quite reasonably. Uh, everyone else in elected office tends to get paid. I have no problems with doing it for citizens too. The critical thing that we started to pose there is governments, in Australia at least, do like to say they have all the answers. We start from a blank page. It's very important if government starts to say, oh, but this is our preferred solution, citizens will say, go do it then. Share the problem. Simply pose a question and give them the background information. Our projects run on that information where government presents a baseline of facts, 100 to 150 page document citizens will read, but it's worth their time because they're one of 40 or 50 citizens who will ultimately get an answer from a mayor, from a minister, from a premier. Think about it yourself. Right now you're one of, I think it's 2.7 million voters in Madrid, for those of you who are local. There's no point reading things really. You're one of 2.7 million people. Go and enjoy the city. But if I make you one of 50 people, your incentive to read things change. And there was a question earlier about citizens don't really want to deliberate, citizens don't want to think. When you're one of millions, I agree with you. What we've tested is, if you're one of a small group, you do. Our goal, and it's a word I, I strangely don't feel I've heard over the last couple of days, is simply trust. That's the society I want to live in. A government may have to announce a very hard decision, a very challenging point, and I want to pick up the newspaper and say, well, 
gee, I'm going to have to pay a bit more. Looks like bad news. But a group of people like me were involved in the decision, so I guess it's fair enough. Right now, it seems that nowhere in government, they, they can't change the smallest detail without it being a great controversy. And that's because controversy moves elections. And that brings us full circle. Why is it effective? Consistently, and I'll give you just three projects here as just a quick look, and we won't go all the way through them. The most recent project we've come out of is uh, the ACT, Canberra, is our national capital. Urban planning, the city had to change. As a citizen, if you hear that your planning laws are going to change, what's your reflexive opinion? Property developers. They're donating money to everyone. You probably don't trust the plan. Now, if I slow you down and say, we planned this city in the 1920s, and the laws have never changed, there's now four times as many people living here. We ask citizens simply, what are the housing choices we want in our city? We asked them an open question. We didn't provide them any uh, idea as to what the city actually wanted to do. We gave them three months. And in that time, they heard from property developers, they heard from professional planners, they heard from home builders, they heard from low-income groups and uh, social housing operators. They heard from 35 sources. And that's a really interesting exercise in one of the key principles they landed on was that they would trust a system with fewer rules, but a couple of rules that meant far more. And that was really interesting for the department who felt that they have to have many, many, many rules, and removing even one would look like a concession to property developers. Why were they empowered to do it? Because the newspaper covered them and showed, I don't want to point at people, but young, old, different races and backgrounds. We have a very multicultural society. And they showed these people talking to the case for change rather than professional planners, rather than those in elected office. The most visible project we've run uh, was commissioned by a state premier, Premier Jay Wetherill in South Australia. My advocacy to those in elected office is to ask, tell me what's hard. The best way to test if a new idea in democracy is going to work is you work on a real problem with the community. So I, I meet as many politicians as I can and I say, tell me your hardest problem. And we got a call from the office of the Premier who said, we're thinking of taking the entire world's nuclear waste and building a high-level waste facility on indigenous land. <laughs> yes, we got police protection. But we said this is absolutely an ideal example. You've got two problems as a government. They just commit, uh, completed a royal commission. It's our highest form of public inquiry. Nine million dollars. We said, that's fantastic, but nobody's going to read it. Anyone read an a government inquiry report? Your second problem is you're going to go through the illusion of community engagement. You're going to get 30,000 negative comments, but you're going to come back and say, now that we know the negative comments, we know how to do this properly. And everyone's going to say, well, that was a sham. They're the two problems I'd like to solve for you. How did we do it? The first part of the project took 54 citizens from across South Australia, and we said to them, you're going to write the government's collateral about this. What are the parts of the Royal Commission everyone in South Australia needs to know? So they physically wrote every word on an insert that went uh, not into a voter booklet, <laughs> that went into the Sunday newspapers. And citizens went through and said, these parts we trust. These are the outstanding questions that we have. They found common ground. The second part of the process that we ran encouraged citizens to look at all the feedback from across the state. And what's most interesting in a debate that was hallmarked by people saying, this is very unsafe, or this is the only economic way forward, was this piece of citizen insight. They said, you promised to build us a freeway that was going to cost $150 million. It cost 400. You promised to build us a hospital that was going to cost $500 million. It cost 2.2 billion, and it's still not open. You're saying you can build a nuclear waste facility for $13 billion. 
we don't think you can build it. It's a really interesting insight for a government where debate is normally very predictable. You go for the emotional issues and hit really hard. What was interesting, that the government didn't proceed for an entirely separate reason, actually originated by citizens. I'd encourage you at this point not to think good or bad. There are no right answers in public discussion, in public policy. There's simply an answer that a given community can live with. Another community might say, I'm so glad that you built this in my state because of the economic opportunity it provides. That community could say, it's not for us. It's not about getting a right answer that maybe agrees with your views. I've lost my clicker. Where are we headed? Now, um, this is something that some years ago, we used to get laughed at. People would just say, this is the stupidest idea I've ever heard. You're going to get everyday people off the street to consume complex information. As you've heard from previous speakers, people can do it. About a year ago, Kofi Annan stood up to welcome people to a conference hosted by the New York Times, filled with the great and the good and who can afford expensive airfares and expensive hotels to listen to Kofi Annan speak. And he said, democracy everywhere is in trouble. And there is one truly great idea that needs to be trialled. And it is the use of juries of citizens given time to think. As a result, the UN Democracy Fund has now taken an interest in this methodology. All we can ever do is take examples where we can, and Madrid should be a fabulous example of this, and no longer take our word for it, but let's show, don't tell. And that really, hopefully, is the takeaway message of as you see this spread around the world, in the UK, in Australia, through the UN Democracy Fund, we will run three pilot projects in uh, South America and Africa, that more and more people are trying to do something new. But when you think, why am I doing it, please think about the problem you're solving so that you are killing rats and not killing cats. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Jan. Vamos a abrir un turno de preguntas. We're going to open uh, questions. Three questions, okay? So, think a little bit. Pensar un poco qué preguntas queréis hacer. Si no hay ninguna, yo, I can, can I ask you, Jan? Uh, because your last sentence here was look at the UK. <laughs> the UK, there was someone from the Ministry of Culture came and visited one of our projects. Uh, they returned to the UK, who was obviously experiencing some challenges with division and how you bring communities together. The Ministry of Culture has now given pilot funding for eight demonstration projects around the country. So local governments are being asked, show us your hardest problems and there will be a response with a set of designs to run demonstration projects. Again, it emphasizes the show, don't tell element. For uh, some time, our greatest challenge in, direct, in deliberative democracy has been two things. Huge advocacy for, well, we'll just have referenda on everything, and we just need to elect a great leader. With the Brexit vote, people are realizing the limitations of purely direct models. We actually need to get people to think. And if there's not going to be questions, I can run a quick experiment in the room just to see if people... I've only done this once and it works, so this could go horribly wrong. Um, I'm guessing climate change is a topic people feel quite strongly about. Is that... And we look around. Would you feel equipped to vote today on a climate mechanism? Would you vote in favour of uh, more of the world taking the European approach to renewable energy. I need some pulse. I'm trying to get a sense here. There's, do we need to call an ambulance? Um, okay, so people would feel that you would vote for a European climate mechanism being spread around the world. I come from Australia where people criticise that, you know, we're from the dark ages, so I'm going to play with you a little bit. 
What's the leading source of renewable energy in Europe? Anyone just want to throw up a show of hands? I'll take two or three. What's the leading source of renewable energy in Europe? I've got wind at the front. Sun. A couple more. Oh, I haven't got my... Wind, okay. It's firewood. Firewood. If you Google now, percentage of wood in EU renewables. Just Google, you've got on your phone, Google percentage of wood in EU renewables. As at 2016, it's 45%. Why am I having you do that? Because I'm, I'm trying to add a data point to show that as we add data, people's opinions change. Climate change is actually a fabulous political issue because it motivates people to vote at polar extremes. It really motivates and fires people up. They go, oh, they, I'm going to vote for the right of politics. Ah, oh, I'm going to vote for the left of politics. And you tend to think in terms of good guys and bad guys. Wood is 60% dirtier than coal. Wood, Wood is 60% dirtier than coal. Now, I don't care about the issue specifically. I run a process organisation. We don't advocate for policy. What we encourage people to do is think. And hopefully that's an example where you start to look at the... I'm, I'm trying to do a live fire test where you can challenge me by looking up facts on your phone. But almost everyone, when we do that, bless those who did it, wind solar, wind solar, wind solar. Think of all the information you have consumed across the last 10 years on this topic. And yet the first fundamental is wrong when we check the facts. We think we all know as citizens quite a lot about issues. What I've learned from doing this job is it's a great exercise to ask citizens, how are you going to make an informed decision? Our democracy needs informed decisions more than it needs popular decisions. I'm trying to go a little free range there. Did that prompt questions or are we really killing people at this point? But did, did, you, did you answer my question? Okay. Completely. So I didn't get it. I'm sorry. Tuned out. Okay. Um, ya, Jan sabe muchísimo también sobre eh, preguntas muy prácticas que todos nos hacemos a la hora de, de implementar este tipo de proyectos. Antes ha habido preguntas muy eh, sobre eso. Ahora eh, es verdad que él no ha entrado tanto en este detalle, pero si tenéis preguntas de este tipo, si estáis pensando en poner en marcha este tipo de procesos en vuestros diferentes lugares, no dudéis en, hacerles, eh, en, hacerles, en hacerle preguntas sobre eso. ¿Alguien se anima a una pregunta? Porque si no, si no yo tengo una más. ¿Sí? Bueno, la pregunta era trampa porque era renovable no es lo mismo que sostenible. ¿No? Entonces era un poco de trampa la que has hecho antes. ¿No? Eh, entonces se eh, trataría de, de, que, de permitir a la gente que delibere para, eh, para contrarrestar la información que dan los lobbies, entiendo. No lo ha comentado nadie, pero si se abren procesos de este tipo en los que los propios ciudadanos y ciudadanas deliberan para eh, dar ellos una información objetiva, eh, ¿cómo se bloquea de alguna manera la información que pueda estar subvencionada por lobbies ajenos a este proceso, por partidos políticos, empresas, etc. It's a really good question we get asked by governments all the time. Um, our advice is always citizens are smart enough to figure things out. Now one of the most central elements of our methodology that we insist facilitators do is we deliver a critical thinking exercise and a biases exercise. So think in terms of there's a three minute video and materials on our website, because in our day to day lives we don't often do a lot of critical thinking. And encouraging people to think about accuracy, the motivation of the source, and it can matter across anyone that they hear from, it's a really good questioning exercise. So we equip citizens with the, with the tools to think and ask questions, and we do it immediately before those active voices come into the room. Uh, in my experience, um, particularly the lobby voices, and, and like the previous speakers, that is from the commercial corporate lobbyists through to the uh, NGOs who are professional fundraisers, they're very, very good at having a three-minute pitch and a 10-second pitch for the news. 
So expose them for about an hour and see how they go under questioning. One of my favourite citizen examples was actually on an energy project we ran in 2012. Uh, an energy consultant had presented a paper and it looked wonderful. Honestly, you know, you read things and think that is very impressive. Had graphics from the NASA JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory and Lawrence Livermore Labs. It looked amazing. And he was making the case that there's so much loss from transmission, there was an efficiency to be gained. And a citizen asked a question and said, can you walk through that chart on page 15? And he said, I've, I've worked in this field for 32 years. It's tremendously complicated and I can't begin to explain it to you. And he said, well, you could try. I'm a physics teacher. In a mixed group of people, you'll get a massive array of skills. In that environment, the politicians who had retained us, and it was a joint committee of the parliament, so politicians of left and right, four of them were at the back of the room. And people from both parties said, thank God we did this. We were about to recommend that. Because the elected tier came from a very narrow range of experiences. So to come back to your question, yeah, we let everyone present. I would rather have people consume all sorts of information because the minute you exclude someone, they get to play the martyr. They get, ah, oh, my view wasn't considered. No, let them have the scrutiny and citizens are capable. Critically, give them enough time. If you try to do that in 10 minutes, that stays superficial. Do it in an hour, six or seven speakers together, small group discussion rotation, and you'll get over the uh, unprovable elements of what they say. Con el riesgo de repetir un poco lo que acaba de decir, ellos trabajan todo el tiempo, eh, o sea, manejan los grupos o gestionan los grupos por tareas. Eh, lo, los grupos están divididos, como hemos visto, en mesas pequeñas y to, to, o sea, cada media hora cambian de tarea. Entonces, una tarea consiste en ver cuáles cuál son los vacíos de información, dónde, dónde, qué es la información que necesitamos. Y, y para eso eh, giran, de, o sea, están al, al menos en tres mesas diferentes con tres grupos de, de personas diferentes. Luego ven qué, qué, qué expertos eh, nominar, o sea, nombrar o cuáles quieren audicionar. Eh, entonces, eh, ahí también otra vez discusiones en pequeñas mesas y van rotando de mesa en mesa. Luego hay otra tarea que consiste en preparar la, la, las preguntas a los expertos, otra vez cambiando de mesa, etc. Y cuando ya el día que llegan esos expertos... Eh, eh, Los expertos en general no hacen ponencias así como hoy eh, un, al grupo entero, sino que también van eh, turnando de mesa en mesa respondiendo a las preguntas que ya fueron eh, preparadas. Es decir, todo esto está como muy, muy, muy pre preparado para que, que realmente todo este, este trabajo sea muy efectivo y muy productivo. ¿Más preguntas? Sí, ahora hay... Eh, bueno, es una pregunta sacando un poco el foco de los mini publics, pero el, estamos acostumbrados a que los activistas, movimientos sociales, sean realmente la voz de protesta eh, de cara a los gobiernos representativos. ¿Cuál es el tipo de articulación que pueden tener los movimientos sociales con los mini public? ¿De alguna manera los mini public neutralizan? ese movimiento, imaginando que, que los mini public fueran, no como ahora, que son experiencias muy, muy, casi muy singulares e aisladas, pero eh, si fueran institucionalizadas, ¿qué pasaría con los movimientos sociales o cómo se articularían esos dos tipos de conocimiento que son un poco distintos? It's a good question. Where I see the value of active social movements is to get things on the agenda to be talked about rather than insisting on a fixed solution. You see the, the points of difference there. The example I really like is from a, an advocacy group in Australia, uh, Animals Australia. So they are vegans and vegetarians who campaign against all sorts of uh, 
like animal export, farming, etc. And the, and the example they gave to me is they said, we've realised we can't campaign for a lot of the animal rights objectives we want because people really like bacon. You know, 99% of people really like it. We'll never win. And so po what politician is going to side with the vegetarians and vegans versus the rest of the population? And they said, we've, they were on a phone call and they said, we're thinking of changing our advocacy to ask for a process. And the process we would ask for is, how would we like the animals who end up in our supermarkets to be treated? They are backing that they are right. They are backing that a group of citizens who actually spent time on it would agree with their point of view. You see that your public opinion reaction might be, I really like bacon. But your judgment reaction after a couple of months might be, well, we can't do these things to animals. We really don't like that. That's where we see the intersection of active advocacy with a role for mini publics and randomly selected citizens. Does that answer your question? Si, si me puedo permitir también una respuesta corta. Sí, sí un, un minuto. Sí, un, perdón. Eh, o sea, respondiendo a la misma a la misma pregunta. Eh, los, los, eh, la sociedad civil organizada y los movimientos sociales se convierten en, en expertos en, es, en esos paneles eh, ciudadanos. ¿vale? Creo que antes también lo hemos comentado en Oregón. Sí, bueno, Claudio Zule de Puerto Montt, de Chile. Eh, en el ámbito de la línea de la información, la pregunta es cómo o con qué herramienta, o si lo hacen o no lo hacen, eh, se puede hacer una distinción, una diferenciación entre las posiciones sociales en relación a una temática antes del proceso de los grupos pequeños y de las consultas y los, las transformaciones que tiene ese, esa eh, decisión que tiene la gente a lo largo del proceso, a, a lo largo del proceso de información. Recuerdo que en Chile hubo una encuesta previa a una consulta y la gente votó un 75% por una posición y cuando pasó el proceso de información y vino de nuevo la consulta, los números se dieron vuelta. El 75% votó por la otra posición. Es decir, ¿cómo piensa la gente antes? ¿Cómo está informada o desinformada antes? ¿Y cómo se mide eso, el antes? ¿Y cómo se mide el post, ¿verdad?, eh, de la influencia de la información. It's, it's less that we measure it than that we know that effect occurs. Um, polling is the art of uh, asking people what they think when they haven't had time to think. It's, when you think about it, it's a terrible way to think about what society thinks. Um, what do you think the tax rate should be for people who earn 50,000 euro? Uh, uh, you've got this question on your phone, why are you answering this question at all? So we know that people, we have a reaction, the same way you have a reaction to a football team or something similar, you have an emotive response. Um, that's the piece that we know about very well, that we make decisions without information today, and maybe that's the problem. In terms of measuring the transformation, it's not something we've really uh, done. Obviously, projects throw up accidental examples, but nothing more than that. Thank you, Ian. Vamos a dejarlo ahí. Vamos a agradecerle a Ian. Uh, Aplauso. Okay.